Tonight, a powerful hurricane barrels toward Florida with millions in its path. Hide from wind, run from water. Bracing for impact, the conditions making Idalia so dangerous. CBC News learns Ottawa is looking to do away with 24 Sussex Drive. There's no way to make that site safe at a reasonable cost. The potential new homes for Canada's Prime Minister. An Australian surgeon's horrifying discovery. So I pulled it out and I thought, gosh, what is that? It's moving. How an eight centimeter worm grew in a patient's brain. This is The National with Asha Tomlinson. Good evening, Adrian is away. Tonight, millions in Florida and beyond are bracing for a major hurricane to make landfall. Idalia is bearing down on the Gulf Coast with winds already over 160 kilometers per hour, and it's only gaining strength. Take a look at the sheer size of the storm from space. The storm is being fueled by the especially warm waters of the Gulf of Mexico. Idalia is expected to make landfall early tomorrow morning as a Category 3 hurricane. After hitting Florida, forecasters say it could maintain its strength as it turns toward Georgia, then the Carolinas. Katie Nicholson shows us why officials are warning the storm is especially dangerous and how people are preparing. Still hours away from making landfall, Idalia already flooding Florida's Gulf Coast. The hurricane is rapidly strengthening to a Category 3 storm with winds that could surpass 180 kilometers an hour. But that's not FEMA's main concern. The number one killer in all of these storms is water. And Adelia's storm surge will pack a life-threatening punch, as high as three to four and a half meters in Big Bend, where the panhandle meets the peninsula. In Tampa Bay, it could combine with higher than normal tide. So if you can just go in 10, 20 miles inland, where the water won't be an issue, that's what we are advising to all of our residents and do it now. All day, Floridians shored up their defenses in part to quell their fears. It's going to be bad. I don't have a really great feeling about it. I'm hopeful, but I just think that we're about due. This storm bringing back a flood of bad memories for people like Lisa Lavoie, who last year lost everything in Hurricane Ian and barely escaped in waist deep water. It just was so fast. It was raw sewage and um, all kinds of chemicals and, you know, it bubbles up from the ground. And when it does, very few here have any protection from its damaging effects. About 18% of Florida homeowners carry flood insurance. That means 82% don't have any financial protection for floods. On the ground, a different kind of protection at the ready. A fleet of power crews. 5,500 National Guard have been activated, with reinforcements on the way from nearby states, and a presidential promise of help to the governor. We're providing everything that he possibly needs. We're in constant contact. Just how big that need will be, hinging on Adalia's power and path of destruction. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Washington. Now, Katie mentioned that storm surge is a particularly dangerous threat. Take a look at what it did to the state during Hurricane Ian last year. Later on in the show, Andrew Chang will break down why storm surge is just so damaging and what makes Florida so susceptible to it. Some essential workers are being called back to Yellowknife as the Northwest Territories rolls out a re-entry plan for city residents. As Juanita Taylor explains, evacuees are welcoming that news but also wanting more information. Sharks evolved before dinosaurs. Caitlin Murdoch has been trying to keep her kids busy while staying in this hotel room, waiting to hear when they can return home to Yellowknife. We just stocked up on a bunch of food, so in case we go back. The green light should be coming any day now. She and her husband are both essential workers. I'm assuming I'm going to get a phone call or an email when I'm told that I need to go back. but. Is it tomorrow or is it in four or five days from now? The territory's five-phase re-entry plan is already underway. Essential workers are high priority. Normally we have 12 checkouts. Grocery stores are among the basic services the city wants up and running before most residents return. 
we're going to need uh, our staff back. Uh, we can't uh, run a grocery store and service a community of 20,000 people with only eight staff members. Services like water and sewer need to be operational too, so do hospitals. Yellowknife's mayor says until that's done, evacuees should stay where they are. We do have uh, checkpoints up, and if your name's not on that list, you will be turned away. We just want to go home, that's for sure. But getting the message out about the re-entry plan could be a challenge. Yeah, I've, I've heard about the fact that there is a plan. Um, not sure on any of the details on it. Officials will need to connect with residents scattered across the prairies and help them return. We've uh, introduced now a travel subsidy to support every vehicle that drove down, that the, that, that vehicle will have some supports to drive back. And that drive has its own challenges. Fires are still burning near some highways into Yellowknife, and that could complicate plans to get people home safely. Juanita Taylor, CBC News, Edmonton. An Ontario man is facing new charges in connection with the death of 12 people. He's accused of selling them a product they use to take their own lives. And as Thomas Degla shows us, he's still a suspect in several other cases. Once a cook at a Toronto hotel, Kenneth Law is now under investigation for more than 100 deaths around the world. It's something that we would like. Police accuse him of helping vulnerable clients kill themselves and they found more alleged victims in cities across Ontario. The police have laid an additional 12 charges of counseling or aiding suicide. Investigators say from late 2020, Law ran websites selling a potentially lethal substance, plus masks and hoods, to clients considering suicide. Now from Thunder Bay to Toronto, police have linked 14 deaths to Law. British investigators are examining a further 88 cases and CBC News has found police around the world suspect at least 108 deaths may be tied to that one man. In all, how many deaths are being reviewed or have been reviewed for links to Kenneth Law? What I can say is we believe 1,200 uh, packages, over 1,200 packages, were sent out to over 40 countries globally. Families who lost loved ones have since found emails and receipts linking the deaths to Law's websites. This torn-up invoice was only found after 17-year-old Anthony Jones ingested the poison he'd ordered. You know, after I got 911 on the phone, he proceeded to scream over and over, I want to live, I want to live. Neha Raju was 23, Tom Windsor 29, Law's youngest alleged victim only 16, several struggling with mental health issues. And many alleged victims appear to have found Law's products through a pro-suicide forum that remains online. Noelle Ramirez was 20 when she died in March. She uh, ran into a person who was more than willing to coach her through this and then, and then in turn sell her the product. Law has denied wrongdoing and remains in custody. He returns to court next week. This is a case that's very widespread and we could possibly see extradition followed by extradition to a number of countries. So Thomas, you've learned more about Kenneth Law's alleged victims. What can you tell us? Yeah, we obtained these court documents today that have information about Law's 14 alleged victims across Ontario. They were between 16 and 36 years old. One man in Markham died in April. That was just uh, less than a month before Law was arrested. Now keep in mind, British police got in touch with Law previously and uh, he appears to have kept selling his products afterwards. Uh, just across Canada, police say he sent out at least 160 packages that are all part of the investigation now, Asha. Wow, Thomas, thank you. You're welcome. If you or anyone you know is in crisis, help is available. To speak to someone, you can call 1-833-456-4566. That line is active 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You can also text 45645 from 4 to midnight Eastern Time. CBC News has learned that the federal government is looking for a new official residence for the Prime Minister, meaning 24 Sussex Drive may never again house a Prime Minister. It hasn't been occupied since Stephen Harper moved out in 2015. Since then, the dilapidated home has been in a constant state of renovation updating the electrical systems, removing things like mold, even rats. As Daniel LeBlanc shows us in the CBC exclusive, the federal government is exploring other options that would be more modern and, above all things, safe. 
24 Sussex looks good from afar. But upon close inspection, it doesn't meet modern standards, especially when it comes to the security of the Prime Minister. First of all, it's fairly easy to scale this, this uh, particular fence. The distance is rather short for someone that really dashed towards a residence. Pierre-Yves Bourdieu used to be in charge of security for Canada's official residences. Bourdieu is one of many experts who argue 24 Sussex no longer offers adequate protection against drone attacks, truck bombs or snipers. The grounds are too narrow for comfort. The building is sandwiched between the Ottawa River and Sussex Drive. If you consider the current situation with regards to public safety and security threat to our Prime Minister, this location is obviously not appropriate. Since Stephen Harper left eight years ago, the home has sat empty, plagued by faulty electrical systems, mold and vermin. The residence is being completely gutted. It's unlikely 24 Sussex will ever return to its traditional role. My understanding of it is there's no way to make that site safe at a reasonable cost. Radio Canada has learned Ottawa is actively looking for other properties to build a brand new residence. Potential sites include an idyllic spot down the street called Rockcliffe Park, where this parking lot could accommodate a residence that is big enough and safe. Justin Trudeau and his children currently live at Rideau Cottage on the grounds of Rideau Hall a situation many experts deem unworthy. I think it's embarrassing that a G7 country can't provide a safe, uh, secure residence. I'm biased towards history. Even I mean, those who want to preserve 24 Sussex kind of believe it's time for Ottawa to make up its mind. No one wants to spend money on it because no one will make a decision because they don't want to be criticized that they're doing something for themselves. The Conservative leader doesn't object to a new residence as long as the price is right. It should just be a very basic a secure place where a prime minister can live safely uh, at a reasonable cost to taxpayers. The government promised to settle the matter of 24 Sussex by the fall, but a new minister was put in charge last month, which could delay a final decision. The hope for many is that the government will find the political coverage to put an end to this saga before the next election. Daniel Leblanc, CBC News, Ottawa. A Saskatchewan First Nation says it's found what they believe are 93 unmarked grave sites at a former residential school. 79 children and 14 infants. But we know that's not a final number. Earlier this month, the community said it located 83 potential grave sites at the former Beauval Residential School using ground-penetrating radar. Now an additional 10 have been found. The band says after consulting with archaeologists, they believe these are grave sites. The search will continue on other areas of the former school grounds. A reminder, support is available for anyone affected by residential schools. You can access emotional and crisis referral services by calling the 24-hour National Crisis Line. That number is 1-866-925-4419. Canada has updated its travel advisory to the United States, warning LGBTQ people that new state laws and policies may affect them. The risk level is still green, listed as take normal security precautions. And the advice doesn't call out specific locations. But when asked for details, Global Affairs Canada pointed to laws banning drag shows and restricting access to gender-affirming care for transgender people. Pope Francis is facing criticism tonight for praising the old Russian Empire while addressing a crowd of young people. His comment, some say, is too close to Vladimir Putin's justifications for invading Ukraine. Briar Stewart brings us that reaction. This is the only recording of Pope Francis' address to a young Russian audience and the moment he appeared to make an impromptu appeal. You are heirs of the great Russia, of Peter the Great, of Catherine II. You're the heirs of the great mother Russia. Go forward. Those remarks were not included in the official transcript released by the Vatican. Its officials are trying to clarify them. The Pope intended to encourage young people and certainly not to exalt imperialist logic. But to Ukrainians, the words were painful. Many, many thousands of Ukrainians perished during that time. Lands were taken over. And certainly um, Peter I and Catherine the Great are people who are not um, good examples for us. 
Bishop Kenneth Nowakowski says he believes the Pope was probably trying to connect with the youth, but the Kremlin seized upon the words, saying the talk about carrying on Russian heritage is very, very gratifying. Pope Francis has frequently condemned Russia's war, but last year he was criticized by some when he described Russia's war as perhaps somehow either provoked or not prevented. Nowakowski says he's received a lot of calls about the Pope's latest remarks and is asking people to be patient. However, I think we are looking for some further type of explanation of what these words could really mean, because for us, it's been very hurtful. He says he and other Ukrainian bishops will get a chance to speak to Pope Francis directly next week in Rome. Briar Stewart, CBC News, London. It just got a lot more expensive to drive a high-polluting vehicle in London. The ultra-low emission zone that once covered just the core now covers the entire city, meaning millions more people will have to pay up. And as Chris Brown explains, that's getting pushback. Belching vehicles have been penalized in London for years already, but as of Tuesday, the city's polluter pay ULES, or ultra-low emission zone, expands to cover some 9 million residents, and the backlash has been surprisingly fierce. It's all part of a big lie. It's all about taxation for um, Mr Khan, our mayor. This is Sutton in southwest London, where motorists will now have to pay roughly $20 Canadian a day if they drive an older polluting car. The mayor's office claims 85% of the vehicles in this newly expanded zone are already ULES compliant, so few people will end up paying more. Opponents see it as a new tax on cars that will mostly hurt the poor. The city claims the original smaller ULEZ got tens of thousands of older, dirtier vehicles off the road and emissions fell significantly. But the opposition has gone far beyond protests. Police claim more than 300 cameras used to monitor the scheme have been either stolen or deliberately damaged, with vandals boasting about their crimes online. Until now, the ULEZ had enjoyed strong public support but it's been hijacked in the run-up to the next British election campaign, says this political observer. I think it has run into a, an attempt by some to use this issue to try and reposition the Conservatives ahead of a, a general election next year and a sign that environmental issues are going to be used as a wedge vote. London's Labour mayor, who's championed ULEZ, was unrepentant. This is about helping our air be cleaner. Every penny net made is used to reinvest in public transport. The mayor has tweaked his plan, offering people with non-compliant vehicles up to £2,000 to get a cleaner one. But that's done little to quell the toxic political fallout. Chris Brown, CBC News, London. Ontario's government says it's considering returning environmental protections to two parcels of land in Ajax after the owner put them up for sale. That land was removed from the protected green belt last year as part of a controversial land swap meant to spur on housing development. But in a statement today, Premier Doug Ford said the owner's intention to sell was not disclosed to the government's facilitator. He continued, this behavior goes against everything that our government is doing to bring home ownership into reach for more people. In a scathing report earlier this month, the Auditor General found that land swap was heavily influenced by property developers with close ties to the government. Doctors in Australia made an unusual and shocking discovery during a routine brain biopsy, an eight centimeter worm. Paige Parsons tells us what experts believed caused it. I dissected around the abnormal area that you could see on the skin. It sounds like something straight out of a horror movie. I took my tweezers or my tumour holding forceps and I pulled it out and I thought, gosh, what is that? Dr. Hari Priyabandi pulled an eight centimeter long worm out of a woman's brain. It was alive and wriggling when our poor uh, but very skilled neurosurgeon took it out with some forceps.
It happened to a 64-year-old Australian woman who was suffering from an unexplained illness for over a year. So then, of course, there was a flurry of activity in our microbiology laboratory, just trying to work out what this worm was. We worked out that this was uh, a new parasite that had never been seen in a human before. The parasitic roundworm is usually found in pythons. Researchers' best guess is that the woman inadvertently ate some of the worm's eggs after picking warrigal greens, a native leafy vegetable near the python's habitat. And as the larva grew, it migrated to various organs in her body. This is a startling infection, but the world does not need to worry about an outbreak of this infection. While this is an extreme case, there are many other, more common types of zoonotic diseases that pass from animals to humans. In general, good hand hygiene and cooking products like poultry, pig, beef, fish, etc. can avoid lots of these infections. The Australian patient is now back home and doing much better. Her doctors say they hope this unique case helps raise awareness about the risks of zoonotic illnesses. Paige Parsons, CBC News, Edmonton. While streaming services have largely replaced traditional cable TV packages, the prices are feeling more like that old cable bill. Basically, I hit my breaking point when it increases by $10 or so. Why we keep paying more and more, next. Plus, hockey's new original six. The journey to get us here has been long, it's been twisted, it's been empowering. The women's league gets ready to hit the ice. And look what was roaming the streets of Halifax. And I was just like, what was that? The exotic predator and the house cat that stood its ground. We're back in two. Lots of disappointed Drake fans last night in Vancouver. His concert was postponed at the last minute due to an equipment issue at Rogers Arena. His show tonight is still on. Fans lining up as early as 7 in the morning just to get in. It is getting more expensive to stream your favorite TV shows. Anis Hidari explains why days of the cheap one-stop streaming shop are gone and likely won't be coming back. An incredibly powerful force field. Dyer Shear Peters has to pay a little more these days after his favorite show switched streaming networks. It's all these extra um, purchases and such, it's becoming very annoying. Basically, I hit my breaking point when it increases by $10. His bills are now around $100 a month for more than half a dozen subscriptions. Paramount space. Plus is just one of the new services. Of course. Netflix now charges extra if you share passwords. And Disney Plus and Spotify are both increasing prices. When these services launched, they were launched at loss leader prices. Prices that weren't sustainable, that the companies knew weren't sustainable. Now industry watchers say the days of low streaming bills are gone. Wall Street basically said to Netflix, we want to see profitability. Right, subscriber growth is no longer going to be the bellwether of success for your company. We need to see profit coming from services such as this. Broadcast and cable TV is becoming less and less profitable. Companies are trying to replace that revenue. So Canadian streaming bills could start resembling older, higher cable bills, say experts. The overall um, you know, Zeller's approach of the lowest prices, the law as far as streamers go, that that's not coming back which means Star Trek streamers have an ever-increasing bill. I don't want to pay for any much more than what I have to. But Canadians will have to boldly pay higher prices to keep streaming. Oh, that damn noise! Anise Hidari, CBC News, Calgary. Ontario is barring athletes from appearing in online gambling ads. Drain that three! I'm trying to practice here, Wayne. You need it. The ban includes active and retired figures. It comes into effect at the end of February. Ontario's gambling regulator says it made this decision because these campaigns are likely to influence minors. Restrictions are also being applied on celebrities who would appeal to young people. As Hurricane Idalia bears down on Florida, the damage could be severe. 
This is going to be a major hurricane. It could have a catastrophic storm surge in your area. The conditions that could make the storm so destructive. Plus, why the dangers in Ukraine could live on even after the war. All right. David Common looks at the enormous task of demining and the Canadians helping the effort. The National takes you deeper into the story shaping our world. Next. Hurricane Idalia is fast approaching Florida, already causing flooding in some coastal areas. Officials are pleading with many residents to evacuate, warning this storm could be life-threatening. Dangerous winds gusting more than 180 kilometers per hour, storm surges that can be as high as 15 feet. Tonight, Andrew Chang breaks down what the devastation could look like and how people can prepare for the worst. Hurricane Idalia is going to slam into Florida by Wednesday morning as a Category 3 storm. Now, the state emergency response team spoke at a news conference telling Floridians to watch this video, which they posted on Twitter. And it's a video of what Idalia might look like when it makes landfall. So you can see here, right in the middle of the frame, I mean, that's a house being washed away in waters that you don't want to be in flash flooding, storm surge, Idalia is considered a major hurricane. In showing this, officials want people to know what's coming because every indication is that when it hits, it could be deadly. A life-threatening storm barreling towards Florida's Gulf Coast. As residents brace for impact this morning, Idalia is now a major hurricane. Idalia expected to produce dangerous winds of up to 115 miles per hour ushering in a potentially deadly 12-foot storm surge. It's already hit Cuba as a Category 1, the wind blowing at more than 100 kilometers an hour. But as a Category 3, when it hits Florida, is when you have sustained wind speeds up to 200 kilometers an hour. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis has been giving daily news conferences. I would prepare to be without power. This thing comes in at Category 3, it's going to knock over trees, it's going to knock over power lines, uh, it's going to cause an interruption in service, so just be prepared for that. So let's go through what Idalia could look like, what the most dangerous part of it is, and how you prepare for a storm that can kill. So typically the greatest threat from a hurricane is storm surge. So that's when the wind blows so hard, it pushes water up and over those parts of land that usually stay dry. This animation does a really good job of showing you what those winds can do when the water is deep. You just get high waves. But in Florida, where you have this huge, shallow continental shelf, so this gentle sloping of land underwater instead of a steep drop off, the water comes in hard. The United States Geological Survey, which studies the impact of hurricanes, says Idalia will likely cause severe coastal change and hazards for coastal communities. So that means overwash on huge swaths of Florida's dunes and sandy beaches. So this is what overwash looks like when you have comparatively tame winds. This was late last year on Florida's east coast. But going back to that video Florida officials are, are pushing to make sure everyone sees, in a storm surge, you can see the transition between a relatively dry street to when the water starts coming in. Gradually pushing further and further inland, you see signs start to wash away, all to the point where trees are mostly underwater. Now this was Hurricane Ian just last year. It's hell on earth as Hurricane Ian slams into Florida. It made landfall on southwestern Florida as a category four. So, you know, that's a bigger storm, yes, but maybe with a similar impact. This is something that happened in Hurricane Ian on Fort Myers Beach. It is a classic example of what is going to happen with the storm surge across the state of Florida. So when the state emergency response team posts this video online, they want people to notice that structures that were previously anchored to the ground maybe won't be so solid anymore. And, you know, eventually, once the water subsides, you know, I mean, like that home that used to be there at the start of the video is gone. So 
Imagine getting swept up in that water, strong enough to push entire buildings out of the way. 150 people died in that storm. Now, Idalia isn't forecast to be as strong, but it's still a force to be reckoned with. This is going to be a major hurricane. It's likely to continue strengthening all the way until impact, and it, it could have a catastrophic storm surge in your area. Mandatory evacuation orders have been issued across the Bay Area. 21 counties along Florida's Gulf Coast are currently under some type of evacuation order. So there's a combination of voluntary and mandatory evacuation alerts in place across Florida, mainly in the northern half. But you do not need to get on the road and try to drive hundreds of miles to get out of any impacts of the storm. That, that will not be, that would not, that's not advisable and it's not necessary. Yeah, this really is just about getting to higher ground avoiding the worst of the storm surge. So preparation is about two things, either getting out away from coastal areas. You're going to experience problems. Again, you, the governor has said it, you're going to experience power outages. So please be prepared for those power outages. If you need power to survive, you need to evacuate. Or you gotta hunker down if you're already far enough inland to be safe. There's been a tax holiday on hurricane supplies. Generators, tarps, batteries, coolers, flashlights, candles, and lanterns. We're here. We're going to stock up while it's tax-free. Preparation's the name of the game. You're prepared, and everything will be taken care of. They're also handing out sandbags, depending on where you live. So, for example, in Orange County, you bring a shovel, they give you bags, you fill up whatever you can, and you go. So this whole area in red, hurricane warning from Alligator Point all the way down to Tampa Bay, that whole area needs to really be on your toes and be preparing now as if by Wednesday morning the hurricane will be moving ashore and adverse impacts and dangerous conditions will be arriving well in advance of that. Thousands of National Guard troops have been activated. Heavy urban search and rescue teams are on standby for when the storm passes. There are 20,000 linemen ready to respond when the power inevitably goes out. And the state government says they have 400,000 gallons of fuel, which is around one and a half million liters, or enough to fill up about 25,000 cars, which is helpful for anyone evacuating who gets stranded. We also have warehouses filled with commodities like food, water, blankets, and medical supplies that are re uh, ready to rapidly move into the impacted area at the state's request. But look, here's the tricky thing. Not everyone heeds the warnings. There are, you know, always people who are caught off guard, many of whom, by the way, lack the resources to just pick up and go. There are dozens of shelters opening up, but some people hold their ground, either in defiance of the storm or because they don't think it'll be that bad where they are. Floridians, after all, are no strangers to hurricanes. But as of the moment you watch this video, the winds are already picking up. The potential danger is already there. Once the hurricane actually hits, all you can do is ride out the storm. Coming up, crucial training for Ukrainian troops led by Canadians. Looking for trip warriors. David Common gets a look at work to remove hidden dangers. A private funeral was held in St. Petersburg today for Yevgeny Prigozhin. The former Wagner Group boss was among those killed in a plane crash last week near Moscow. Prigozhin is also the man who led an attempted coup in Russia back in June. The Kremlin has faced accusations it was behind the plane crash but has denied responsibility. In Ukraine, another service, this one for a highly celebrated fighter pilot known by colleagues as Juice. He was a key figure in Ukraine's lobbying efforts for F-16 fighter jets. The 30-year-old was killed last week following a mid-air collision during a training exercise. Canada is among the countries that has agreed to train Ukrainians in the use of F-16s, one of several responsibilities our armed forces have been tasked with. Another involves a crucial body of work on the ground. Recently, David Common was at an undisclosed location in Poland where he got a first-hand look at a form of training that will be vital for years. These 
These are Ukrainian soldiers moving fast and quiet to deal with a threat, an explosive mine left on a road. All of it, a practice run for what they're facing every day on the front lines. All right, off we go. This training requested by Ukraine, conducted in the safety of next door Poland, delivered by Canadian combat engineers. It was good to see the hastiness of everything, how it went out. These soldiers will be back on the front lines within days. Back in what is now one of the most mined countries on earth, 30% of Ukraine now littered with buried explosives. This is the trench. So we have to be careful walking yeah. here. We're along with senior private Sologub, the only Ukrainian whose face we're permitted to show. The explosive danger comes from booby traps too. Looking for trip wires. When the Russians leave, they'll often booby trap the bodies of their dead, scatter mines out in the open, and sometimes place explosives in laptops, phones, even food left in trenches. I asked her to take a shot of me, Jean. So the Canadian trainers are mocking up messy trenches with fake explosives to ensure the Ukrainians are ready. For a lot of us, will be the pinnacle of our careers up until the point. Um, so it, it means a lot to us. We know that the training we're providing is having a serious effect on the battlefield. Ukraine is littered with mines and unexploded ordnance that will be there for years to come. So the skills that we're teaching here will enable Ukraine to clean up. Now, as dangerous as booby traps and mines are in a trench system like this, in Ukraine, they're all over farmers' fields, which has a deep impact even after the war. This was Europe's breadbasket, a massive agricultural nation with fields now filled with landmines placed by both Russians and Ukrainians. No one has any idea where all of them are, and there are hundreds of thousands out there. You have worked around the world in multiple countries that have mines littering the grounds. How does Ukraine compare? The contamination in Ukraine is massive. The difference, though, is the complexity. Canadian Jasmine Dan is with the mine clearing charity Halo Trust, known for its work and connection to Princess Diana, who championed landmine removal and saw firsthand the devastation wrought from their use. One down, one down, one, million one to go. Firing. War has forced Halo Trust's work to grow. They'll soon have 1,200 mine-clearing staff in Ukraine, often focused on restoring land so families can return, till fields, earn a living. So I spent the last two weeks down in Nikolaev, um, in a town near Snigarivka. While I was there, um, a woman was walking down with her cow, and this is the area where she brings her cow to graze almost every day. And walking right along the line of mines, which if that cow had taken one more step, to the left um, would have killed it as well as the woman. Um, so it feels it feels quite good to know that um, those mines are now gone. She can safely walk her cow, um, and the farmer who plows the field right next to it um, can also do his job safely. But war fighting supersedes all other Ukrainian concerns now. The Canadians training on first aid under fire. Yeah, my leg! There is much learning on how to save lives, but also how to prevent injuries in the first place. Right, so just a little bit of weight on it. Using ropes and a shovel to open a door. That's it, okay? That sound showing this was a booby trap. A soldier opening the door would have been killed. It might not look like anything, it's just a pile of rocks, but. Just a little bit of movement was enough to, uh, to actually function that, okay? Another explosive hidden near rocks, dangers everywhere designed to maim or kill. Long after this war ends, whenever and however that is, Ukraine will be riddled with an explosive legacy. One that's likely to take a decade or longer to clear. Russia's heavy use of mines has continued to slow Ukraine's counteroffensive, making the skills shown to David that much more important. In fact, recently, the country's defense minister said Ukraine is now the most heavily mined country in the world, as he pleaded for more equipment to help with the clearing efforts. 
While excitement is growing for the inaugural season of a new professional women's hockey league, coming up, the Canadian cities that will put teams on the ice. Plus... What's going to happen here? Is it the larger cat going to attack the small cat? A standoff in the streets of Halifax between a house cat and a rare exotic breed. That is coming up in our moment. After years of back and forth, the will they or won't they's, a new professional women's hockey league has finally been established. Six teams have been announced with the intention of bringing together the best women in the sport. Jamie Strachan tells us when they'll hit the ice. Push, push, push! At this Toronto hockey camp, news of a new women's professional hockey league spread quickly. I want to go watch it. I think it's going to be really exciting. I, I'm definitely working towards something bigger uh, in hockey. The journey to get us here has been long. It's been twisted. It's been empowering. The PWHL will launch in January with a 24-game schedule, with six still unnamed teams, three in Canada, in Toronto, Montreal and Ottawa, and three U.S. teams in New York, Boston and Minnesota. Those rosters will be filled from a pool of 300 of the world's best, mostly through a draft to be held next month. Players will earn between thirty-five and eighty thousand dollars. You know, you dream of this as a little girl. You know, to have a a real full setup and be a professional athlete. A breakaway for Sonia. For years, women's hockey has struggled to sustain the excitement and interest after big events like the Olympics. The Canadian Women's Hockey League collapsed in 2019. After that, two separate entities formed, but were never able to unify. Now there's just one league backed by big names like tennis trailblazer Billie Jean King and big money. Mark Walter, the billionaire owner of the Los Angeles Dodgers, is the PWHL's sole financial backer. It also has people with impressive track records like Stan Kasten, a longtime sports executive who has successfully run teams in the NHL, NBA and Major League Baseball. We didn't do this for the short term. We didn't do it for the long term. We did it for it to be permanent. We have plans so far, our business model goes out 10 years. Experts say with people like Kasten involved, this league is different. You've got to make sure that people are entertained for 180 minutes. And I think he's, he's one of the people that has done that for decades. Finally, the possibility of a healthy women's league, a place where young girls can dare to dream. Jamie Strash in CBC News, Toronto. This footage of an exotic cat was captured by Rachel Smith earlier this weekend, not on an African safari, but on the streets of Halifax. The feline predator in the video is called a serval, and as you'll see, it met its match in a house cat named Sammy. The unusual cat standoff is our moment. So I was driving in the neighborhood with my son and I thought it was a piece of garbage in the road and I realized it was actually a cat that had spots all over it. And I was just like, what was that? I was actually fascinated, like, oh my gosh, what is this doing in Halifax? And then I frantically called 311 and a black and white cat just kind of walked and ran with this cat and they kind of met each other on the uh, the rock wall. So I'm kind of going, what's going to happen here? Is this the larger cat going to attack the small cat? But in fact, the black and white cat hit at the larger exotic cat, the Savelle, I think it's called. He was not phased, he just was curious, but the black cat was like hissing, going, you know, keep away, don't come near me. So I'm not really sure what's gonna happen to the cat. I truly hope that this cat's gonna be saved, that nothing happens to it, because it is absolutely beautiful, as you can see in the video. So it all happened really quickly, and uh, it was pretty neat that I was able to get the footage for it, so. Unbelievable, that serval was captured and apparently it's under investigation where it's from, how it got out. They're great jumpers, standing on hind legs. A serval can jump more than nine feet. That's 2.7 meters straight up to apparently grab a bird right out of the air. That was quite the catty fight. That is the National for August 29th. I'm Asha Tomlinson. Have a good night.